Well, my accidental preservation story is about um, finding my way into preservation while trying to find solutions to homelessness. And uh, we began our work, uh, gee, about 23 years ago. Uh, I had been building uh, affordable housing and realized that that was uh, an essential ingredient for solving homelessness. But I hadn't really appreciated how much preserving different types of, um, frankly, sort of despised housing and reimagining them more to the whole task of ending homelessness and creating opportunities for uh, low-income people and also to preserving neighborhoods and, and environments. And so the first project that really spurred a, a new way of thinking about preservation as not simply a, a, a goal around um, important structures, but uh, as a, a key part of solving complex social problems, was um, confronting the Times Square Hotel back in uh, 1990. This is uh, on the corner of 43rd and 8th here in Manhattan. And hard to believe, but that was the day when Times Square was uh, not a place you'd go for uh, yeah, the, the kind of family-oriented and whatever entertainment now, but a pretty gritty place. And uh, the hotel was in bankruptcy and it was um, housing of last resort, really, and had been for some period of time for individuals who um, had uh, uh, pretty profound health and mental health problems. Uh, the building was uh, like one floor of it was burned out. It was known in the press as homeless hell because the city had started uh, placing homeless families there out of desperation before they had any kind of system together. But um, uh, in uh, having uh, been in the business of um, building affordable housing, um, was looking at this building and the uh, the, the prospect of about 700 uh, units at that time just disappearing from uh, the landscape as housing for uh, people in need, um, uh, put together a group that actually found a way to turn the building into um, what is now uh, called and is, uh, I think, a recognized solution around the country, permanent supportive housing, which combines affordability with um, the on-site connections to health, mental health, and employment support that people need to get their lives back on track. And so these were the interior conditions. Uh, but what made this building uh, particularly special was that even when the homeless families were relocated, uh, there were still 200 elderly and mentally ill people living there who um, uh, we were committed to preserving. And uh, so it was a pretty complicated renovation. And people in this room helped, like Elise and Bill, with uh, our historic uh, uh, rehabilitation tax credits. Uh, but uh, we were able to turn it into something that is just a really smart solution for housing affordability issues, period, regardless of whether someone has been homeless or not. And uh, uh, essentially, small studio apartments uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, a living dining room space, private bathrooms, and then a very generous common spaces for individuals to uh, actually both interact and have access to some of the amenities and supports people need to uh, put their lives back on track. We uh, started early on thinking that these buildings perhaps were best thought of not as big buildings but as small towns. And uh, that kind of uh, sensibility guided the attention to the common areas and the decision to uh, really uh, use every preservation, every historic preservation tool in the book uh, to really cr create a sense of um, not just dignity, but grandeur and specialness to the building. And um, we were able to create 652 uh, small apartments, half for formerly homeless individuals and half for lower income working people in addition to uh, preserving the housing of the 200 people who had been in the building previous to our acquiring it. Well, um, we weren't sure um, whether that was a fluke or not, that you know, just the circumstances of building in bankruptcy, big public problem, uh, people willing to come together in the city uh, to finance um, uh, a creative solution, whether that was a one-off. And so when um, uh, the Prince George Hotel on 28th Street um, was also uh, sort of in play uh, because of a mortgage foreclosure situation there, um, decided to try to uh, prove that it wasn't a fluke and really think through what are the principles that can guide both the creation of sustainable and replicable strategies to end homelessness, but also to uh, recognize and preserve these buildings as important uh, social assets. So the Prince George was also um, a mess. Uh, it had been used in 
uh, the period 1985 to 1990 as sort of a giant family homeless shelter and just a completely um, kind of unsupervised and, and uh, horrible place for those families to be. Then it had been shuttered and um, also in bankruptcy uh, for a period of time when we acquired it. But uh, using um, low-income housing tax credits, historic rehabilitation tax credits, and some city and state programs, we're able to transform it into 416 uh, units, again, half for formerly homeless people and half for low-income working people. And uh, again, pay particular attention to the public spaces because one of the things we discovered at the Times Square, and we were beginning to think, you know, maybe this isn't, uh, isn't just accidental, but something that's kind of an active principle that we should be organizing around, which is if you create inviting spaces within the building um, that give people a sense of um, yeah, uh, uh, respect and uh, um, a, a strong and proud sense of place, they actually um, are able to participate as members of the wider community differently uh, at the Times Square and again at the Prince George. We found that people from the neighborhood and the wider community uh, were using the building and the public spaces as well and people living in the building could um, again sort of find this uh, path to kind of a mainstream life and uh, that prompted our taking the old abandoned ballroom of the Prince George and creating an event space which actually has become a very important source of revenue uh, to the organization. And uh, uh, one last SRO to permanent supportive ha housing story um, is the restoration and the transformation of the Christopher, which was originally the McBurney YMCA, the first YMCA residence in New York City. And um, if I have a particular crusade around housing preservation, uh, other than public housing, which I'll get to in the country, it's we can't let these YMCAs just slip away. Um, they are the housing that uh, low-income people moving to cities and just you know trying to hang on historically uh, relied on. And many of these buildings have either been sold or converted over the years. We were uh, fortunate, and this is a, kind of a great um, alternate uh, NIMBY story. When this building went on the market, the, um, the residents of the block and the state senator and the council person called us and said, you have to come and build housing for the homeless here, have to preserve this building. So, um, like, yeah, yeah, come on, yeah. So uh, it, was, it was pretty wonderful. And so we were able, there were 13 people who were still living there who had been original tenants. We were able to move them out and move them back in. And so, you know, it's, it's possible to actually find ways to preserve these buildings that actually accomplish uh, important uh, other social and community agendas. And then I think um, th this, is, this is happening about 2002. And I'd say right around then, um, we were becoming a bit radicalized, wondering if our purpose was simply to preserve buildings and create housing, uh, but whether we were um, actually uh, uh, getting at the larger question of homelessness adequately, because these buildings, um, as wonderful as they are, they're, they're kind of complicated and time consuming to uh, restore. And so we sort of opened up another front in our question and started uh, uh, wondering why those people who are still living on the streets of Manhattan were still living there when we'd opened up all these buildings. And so we, um, we started uh, thinking about other buildings like uh, uh, Bowery Hotels, uh, flop houses, and we acquired this one, uh, the Andrews House, um, uh, on Bowery across from Spring and turned it into uh, a new type of flop house. Um, one which was, uh, you know, here's the before and after, one which used the same principles of good design, good management, uh, a diversity of, of, of uses, um, and a real integration with the surrounding community, and importantly, the attachment to the supports people need to thrive. And so, um, again, before and after shots. And so um, I'll just quickly say, um, uh, out of this sense of, you know, are we spending enough time with uh, people who are homeless and designing the right types of responses to homelessness, we began looking at the data on where homelessness comes from in New York, and we found, um, we found really striking similarities in other cities. And this happens to be uh, a heat map of where people leaving New York State prisons had come from. But we know that the very high rates of correspondence between uh, the criminal justice system, the health care system, the mental health system, the foster care system. And you see the very bright red cluster of dots there in kind of the, the right center of Brooklyn. Uh, that's a public housing complex in Brownsville, New York. So over the last few years, we've actually spun off to focus on preserving uh, different types of housing, namely public housing. Interesting to, to Jamie's point, because um, while uh, like flop houses, SROs, 
public housing, easy to dismiss and regret, but um, what if we thought of it as an asset and what we could do to preserve it because in many ways this is the last stand of affordable housing in our city and in the country. Uh, we've been looking at ways, frankly, that Jane Jacobs suggested over 50 years ago to um, sort of unslum the projects, to actually reweave those campuses into the uh, urban fabric. We've been looking at what they're doing in other countries. Uh, this is a project in Paris that uh, actually all of the original tenants were able to remain, but they reclad this building, which looks suspiciously like Tilden Houses in Brownsville, uh, and uh, um, have been able to sustain it financially because of the energy savings and vastly improve the quality of life. And so we're also, as we're looking at uh, strategies for the preservation of public housing, looking at Brownsville's other uh, significant um, remaining buildings uh, that have uh, a historic and kind of cultural meaning and ways that we can preserve and repurpose them. This building is about to open in December as a community center. And this uh, old school building we're um, planning to refurbish as a child care center and affordable housing for families. Thank you.